very uh, vested interest. I like the concept. Bin 5 has proved to be very useful for me amongst my set of colleagues as a way to transfer files. And because bin 5 itself is conceptually a very simple system, this packing is a nightmare. I agree and, and with, with both of those. And, and sure, do nothing with bin 5. But I just think we need readers and a variety of readers. Okay, I encourage any of you to at least think it through. Just go back and remember what's in there and how you're going to pack it. There are things of many different dimensionalities, and that's the challenge for the readers. It's not that it's one array with different dimensions. There are at least three, maybe six different dimensionalities in the same file. And you can do that with, for instance, you could just, the concept of doing that with CSV is pretty intimidating. Well, uh, yeah. So I, I mean, it's a perfectly good question. I can't think of any easy answer. I'm not sure an easy answer exists. The yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, I, so I think you know a subset of us who are here tonight. You, you might think of it. You know, it's it's remarkable how many people do use Excel. And if I just want to have a diurnal plot of the temperature at a landing site, what I want is a really simple file that's temperature, or local time, and temperature. It's a two-column ASCII. Uh, it's a two-column thing in an Excel spreadsheet, and I plot column A versus column B, and I have beautiful temperature. And each latitude is a different column. I'm just saying. It, one could, I'll tell you this, I think this the following statement is true. One could conceptually write an interface to the existing output where you list, I want these columns. And it, you use the reader you have to generate the ASCII output for those things. That is probably not too complicated. But you're not going to get all the stuff that's in bin 52 that way. So, and bin 52 is the result of a decade of interface with a few expert users. Yeah, again, I'm not saying get, do anything with this. I'm saying mm -hmm. if yep. I wanted to run KRC and get a diurnal curve at Gale Crater for Elsa Bass 350, I really don't want to have to get Undergraduate at Wash U doing a class project on the surface temperatures at Gale Crater. I argue that, I argue that that is not our future. No, I argue that it is. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. You're you're talking about the professional user. I'm talking about. You're talking about people who haven't read the paper, for example, well, and won't read the paper. And won't read the paper. Who want a web interface that I type in the lat one and I. And you're right. It's probably one point. It's like. I'm just thinking of it's probably not general one point, purpose but tools. What is the temperature of 2 a.m. for the next year at Gale Crater? So you want the you want the one day file and the one year file. And the, we can define those. Right, fair Make, enough. And I want it in a way that I don't have to read the paper, understand the physics, or buy IDL. And you don't want to buy IDL. I'd, or did they, or, or did Saul Da Vinci? At the, at the risk of making everybody lose their lunch, <laughs> another possibility is HDF5. And if, you, if you've never... <laughs>
And if you've never heard of it, thank your stars. Yeah, that's right. Because, and the point is, there are many potential formats. HDF5 is an, an monstrosity that has grown to address just the question you're asking. And I, I will defend that statement to anybody, that it is a monstrosity. I, I agree. So anyway. But it's widely used yeah. by government installations. Oh, you don't want to touch it. Yes. But anyway, so my, my point. By the way, just to let you, just, those of you who know me probably won't be surprised on this. I found a flaw in HDF5. And I've had verified it with a group at Fermi Labs that it is a flaw in HDF5. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I just. Anyway, it's a good generic question, which I'm going to declare out of bounds for a little bit. Right I, I'm, I'm trying to get this tool yeah. where a thousand people a day are using it, not two a year. Okay. I'll bet you Sherry will say there are a thousand people that would use it. I'll bet there are more people who want to know what are the, what are the temperatures on Kepler 5b, which can, this addresses beautifully. Or what's the coldest temperature I'll ever see it on the moon? We, this is a really powerful tool, but you shouldn't have to have a PhD to run or a computer degree to unpack the output file. And on the screen behind you, Phil. So there's, I got eight of them. I know a lot of colleagues that are salivating because the source code is about to be released. And they can't wait to compare this to the model that they've been running or different things like that. There are, um, I can think of probably a dozen people in the science community that would love to use the MCD. So no, no I, I agree. I, I spent the last decade, though, thinking orthogonal to that. <coughs> thinking about what would a freshman taking a, you know, and there's thousands of those versus tens of the others. Okay. Wouldn't would another audience be the office of uh, human space flight too? I mean, just NASA-wide? I mean, eventually somebody's going to start asking about temperatures right. when we start talking about human exploration. Right. Yep. No, I agree. That's, 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 that's sort of my mindset. Not our colleagues who study Mars, but an engineer who's trying to design a spacesuit to go to an asteroid. Okay, well, let me, let me try to encapsulate the last 30 minutes with a couple of statements. We're talking almost exclusively here about the hind-end interface to the user, the output from it to the user, and I will state without proof that that is an open-ended question because there are many users and many who we don't anticipate. And so the question ultimately is going to be, what fraction of that unknown community do we wish to serve? There's a famous paper years ago on how many undiscovered species of spider are there in Brazil. Okay. Interesting title. How many kinds of users does this routine, this, act, this tool have? And I, we better start, as Kim says, with let's address the communities we recognize as being abundant. And I think you've defined a community which is probably abundant that isn't in the set here, and you're going to, um, it's entirely within your power to build that final presentation system, whatever it is. And I, I'm, it's a, you don't want it to be totally open-ended. Here's what, here's what I did. I have a program which I call, it's called Reeve 52 k.pro, K I should say krc52, it's a mistyped. And what I do is I give it the name, of, and this is actually, this is 
cut and paste the comments to this particular program. And I, I try to write pretty good comments. And Dale would probably, I'd probably fail any professional programmer, um, you know, criterion. But here it is. This is a string of the name of the file you want to read. And then from then on, here's what you get out. A floating point array of the hour, the item, the latitude, the season, and the case. And these are the ones that we talked about before, the first ones. And then you get another array, which is latitudes, items, case. And the, again, see these three, item T, item U, item B? They actually return the names of the things you're getting. Just to remind you of what you're getting. Um, and this gives you the latitude and the, and the elevations. And you, as you see here, the dimensions are different. The reason that's the fundamental problem. We've got things of different dimensionality. This one, triple V, gives you sedums, items, and cases, the dates, and the LCBS, and the global pressure. And then these three give you string IDs for the things I've, I've already defined up here. And then there are four more outputs which are not valid for type 51. This particular reader reads 51 and 52. And then there's a 53 reader and a 54 and a 56 and so forth. But for 52, then there's, there are four more things you get out. Another dimensionality of the max and minimum temperatures for each layer at each latitude, each season, each case. And here's another one with a different dimensionality that gives you these convergence things and the amount of frosts and heat flow and so forth. And then there's two parameters here at the end that give you the names of the things that are in those two. And the function itself, way off over here, something equals all this, is L sub S. So that's the way that this particular reader unscrambles the bin 5 file. And it happens to be written in IDL. And you, could, you can write the equivalent of this in other languages, and you can write one that outputs in CSV. You got the issue you have to address is one, two, three, four, five different dimensionality systems. Something that CSV is, I don't think, built to do at all. Well, but an Excel spreadsheet is. In five pages. In five pages. And have you seen an Excel spreadsheet with five dimensions? Well, I, again, I'm just saying. Excel is built to handle two dimensions. I agree. It right. will handle five, maybe with some god awful known. But all I'm saying is, this is a non trivial problem. We have a tool that's outputting a multitude, it's like outputting things in a multitude of languages, all of which are foreign to the user. And I don't know any other good analogies, but it's a significant problem. If you, if you want all the different kinds of K things KRC can do, if you want to serve the full community, um, for instance, this particular term right here is how much of a prediction did I have to do? I mean, that could really be important to somebody. So I, I, I think this is a hyper language issue. We got at least five dimensionalities potentially to deal with simultaneously. Bin 52 does that. And yeah, I don't know where we go from here. I, it's enough time on this issue, because this is a, we could spend a lot of time here. Um, this, I put this up again for the programmers. What bin 52, the reader, what does the reader need to even do this? Um, it needs to unpack the common. It calls read KRC to com to do that. And that's a, itself a multiple level routine because it can open the file and hold something that tells where it's defined. And then it can go get a particular case or it can cl close the file. It also calls define KRC. And hold here is this, this, remember the four words that are at the very beginning of the bin 5 file for each case? They're here again, except the logical unit. Now the size of the case, the number of cases, and the size of the common. Um, 
And define KRC is an interesting program. It creates a structure that agrees with all of the Fortran commons. Um, it took me a long time to figure out how to do this. And um, it has to, the, the values that are in define KRC have to agree with a KRC com because it's basically, it's a way of transferring from Fortran to IDL the size of everything without actually, you know, the programs themselves don't communicate. So you have to sort of offline tell it what to expect. Yep. 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 They have to be the. They have to be the same. And that is something that. That so these these in this sense they're paired. And any readers, I mean, that's another issue, Phil. Any reader of KRC output is going to have to be aware of what was in the common. The the the, the dimensionalities that were available to KRC when it was written. Um, we could, in th and in fact, um, I don't think I don't think all that information is transferred. It would, in in theory, we could increase that four-word precursor to something like a dozen words without too much effort, and transfer all that information in the file itself. And that that. That might be a good idea. I'm going to write that one down. Even if we don't use it now, it would allow future systems to be less dependent upon this offline communication. Well, let's, let's talk about it over dinner. But I, I'd like to continue this discussion because this is a system, as you've emphasized all day long, that was built at a particular time and place in history. And what if, so just, just for example, what if no matter what you asked for, KRC ran 48 local times or 96, it ran 180 latitudes, it ran 75 layers, and so there was no... It's, it's all there, yeah, all right. Okay, so, and that's what you got every single time, and I wrote a simple reader that could take that gigantic file and give me the thing I wanted. I wouldn't have to be a new reader every time I change the number of layers or a new reader. I mean, I'm just trying to think Except of there's Phil Christensen Jr. out there someplace that says, oh, really? N1 is 200? I need 400. Well, and what do you do? Well, then we should make it 400 now. <laughs> you can't do it, Phil. Well, I, but... <laughs> but Again, okay. you could have a system that could have 12 users, or you could have a system that could have 500 users. Okay, I, I agree in this, and you know, we're, th these are good university professor level questions. They definitely are, and um, don't forget that one of our goals is to distribute the source code so that people who want to, the really expert user, right. can all make those of, changes. All six of those can do that. And the 200 engineers at JSC that are trying to design a mission that's going to go to an asteroid can figure out what the hell the temperature is in 30 seconds on a website. Well, actually, I'm fine because you're only changing, you're just saying the front end and the back end. Those are what you're changing. That's right. That's the stuff in the middle is there. It'll do it. Let's see if I've got any more so, of interest. So, hold on a second. Logistically, it's getting boring. Well, we're approaching the end of, of the stuff. Well, okay, so I stuff. want to take a, uh, so what, what want to take a break? It's a good time. She's going to have food at my house at 6.30. Okay. 
Um, so it's 4.15. We can take a 10-minute break so people can stretch your legs and go for it until 5.30. We can just plow on and what do people want to do? Just take a break. Take a break. Just take a little break. As long as you promise to come back. So what I, what I was assuming is we break at about 6. The broader issues of, you know, user interfaces and websites and inputs and outputs. I should be producing at least some test files and test output as run on my computer at home. Okay. And then we should run those same files down here and get identically the same results. Okay. We're not there yet. Okay. And then other people, particularly those who want to sort of use different flavors of input, trying to address different problems, probably should have a test file for each significantly different style of use. Um, because it's a, I think it's a good idea to have a bunch of test files so that in the future you can, you know, find differences. Same thing with, for example, when you push a new version out, new version of PRC comes out, there may be changes that need to be tested. Mm -hmm. So you will provide us with some test cases <coughs> on the new version that you have tested on your machine and there will, you will Run them over here. Yep, they work. Or no, they don't. And we give you feedback on that. Right. But does that require once again for the test cases that other scientists will write to be updated? Hopefully not. I'm hoping not. Um, one warning, in case it's not obvious yet. <clears throat> but there's nothing here you actually haven't heard enough already today to understand, and that's this. When you run KRC on two different machines, you would expect the differences to be down at the floating point round off level. And most of them will be. But it's possible because of the way KRC does things to get significantly different results. That is on the one degree Kelvin level from otherwise identical runs and it's because the convergence criteria, when tested, may almost be satisfied in one case and not another. So KRD will, KRC will run a whole additional day and then make its leveraged forecast. And the result of that process can generate different temperatures from almost the same input. That's intrinsic again with numerical modeling. There are ways to avoid it. I'm thinking of them as I speak. And what it suggests is we, we have some test cases which absolutely minimize the prediction aspect. In fact, there are ways to make sure they're turned off entirely. So this means what I should do, make some notes to, don't, to remind me, is I should generate some test cases which should, where the differences should be limited to, to floating point numerical round off. That would <laughs> solve a lot of problems. Because at the moment, the test cases we're using are based on the master input file, which does invoke substantial prediction. Okay. Oh, okay, one last thing, because I'm going to disappear at 5.30 to go get <coughs> stuff to be, beat you to my house. Uh, on our scale, the map of the solar system with the sun and Mars, I've added Earth. Um, that's our house, 2075 East Ranch Road. It's just south of water between McClintock and Price. Put it on your iPhone. We'll be there. I, I will need a ride with somebody. Last person out gets me. Ha. But that uh, okay. last person also out has to bring it back because I don't want it for the night. That's harsh. So, and I probably nobody who's living near here is like, oh, anyway, we'll worry about that later. Um, okay, on that happy note, a new topic. Just we're going to a quick overview of the P orb system, the planetary orbit calculator. And this is this is basically the call sequence. Um, P orb MN is the main program, and it includes P orb com dot inc, which is defines the meaning of those 60 magic floating point words. 
Um, and there is, as I said, there is a PR user's guide that um, is currently in the distribution set. Most, it's not in any stuff I've distributed here. But PR MN, actually, it, it just gets the date and time. And then it can call any of the following four programs. This should have been smaller in print. Any of the following four programs in any order, only some of which make sense. I'm going to go through them in the way that makes sense. But these are the options. First, it can read an orbital elements file. PRB1 can access, it calls PRBL, which can read any of four orbital elements files. And the four are um, Seidelman's version of the long period Keplerian elements of the solar system, um, Sturms' version of the same thing, Bowles' version of a number of cometary elements, and a fourth one that's got a few asteroids in it. The point of these is there are four files. They all contain the same kind of information. Each of them is rigorously formatted because they're read by rigorous format statements. And they're, in each of them, the last object is a dummy, which is a format, which is a, you just cut and paste and fill in the values you want for your object. It's just a short form version of orbital elements. There are now almost 400,000 asteroids known, and I am not going to make a file with 400,000 asteroids in it, Phil. But anyway, so what it does, it goes and reads those and computes the basic constants related to that. There's a stupid little routine that converts year, month, and day to Julian date. Um, two routines that compute the planet's pole. One is in ecliptic coordinates and nodes, and the other is computes, just gets the obliquity. And then anything that starts with a rote is part of my, my vector manipulation program. Don't worry about it. It can diagonalize a matrix, rotate things. There's, there's, there's a whole package of standard vector geometry operations and rotation matrices packages. So, so this thing goes out and gets the orbital elements for one particular object and basically computes those 60 magic numbers. Then there's a routine that can take that with these 60 magic numbers and write them either as a binary file or as a text file. And I usually write them as a text file. There's another routine that can actually treat those those 60 things as the basis for an ephemeris and compute an e a printable ephemeris on Tuesday, January 12th, here's where it was, and so forth. It can, you know, the kind of thing you'd find in the nautical almanac. So that's what ephemeris does. And then there's another routine which just looks at the matrices and their inverses and does a whole bunch of manipulations to make sure that everything's consistent. It's only a test program. It's just testing the matrices, you know, going from spherical to Cartesian, from Cartesian back to spherical, back to elements, making sure everything's consistent. So this is P orb. That's what it is. And the way, and normally, the user's guide, it's got at each step here, for instance, when you call P orb one, it'll say, which file do you want? Give me a number one to four. And it'll open that of one of those four files. Which object do you want? Give me a number one to nine or something. Like if it's the planet's file, you give it nine, you get Pluto. You give it one, you get Mercury. You give it four, you get Mars. What epoch, what time in all of history or the future do you want this to be for? Because planetary orbits evolve slowly in time. And that's in there too. It'll, so the default had been, uh, I don't know, 1995. Um, and this number, it actually asks you in fractional centuries from 1950. Because when this program was written, that's what people used. The, 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 you, most, are you guys familiar with J2000? The modern yeah. system is J2000, right? That wasn't around then. It was B1950 is what it was called. And so I started counting from 1950. It would be trivial to change that to be 2000 
probably that's a change we should make. Um, anyway, so that's what P orb, that's the structure of P orb, and then this thing just, these are just print and they're utility routines for matrices and vectors. It's run as a standalone program. The same subroutine that's used in here, this P orb that's used in this, this is the call sequence again. This P orb is identical to the one used, but it's the same routine used by KRC. The inputs are these elements formatted text files, and there is a user guide. And I don't think we need to know any more about that. Now we're going to get into some things I haven't discussed with anybody, including Sadat, who's not here, but that's all right. Ken is here. Um, if the first input line to KRC has a third non-zero element, if and only if, then KRC will read another line that none of you heard about before. And that line contains six integers, and those six integers go through common and set all kinds of debug flags. They turn various things on and off that will print debug statements. Um, I, someplace, and I've forgotten where, so these control all these optional write statements. And there is, in the help list, the one you have, I hope, today, there's a section called debug options. And there's a listing of, in very terse form, of everything you can turn on and turn off. It's very terse. It would be most virtually meaningless unless you had the program. But at least tells you where to look for these things. Um, one, so the issue, the issue is, do we leave those in, hidden, or take them out? This is another thing that I don't think many people do. Um, the first input line is two parameters, k old and k and keep, and then there's this debug thing, which I said only if it's there do you do something. These two have to be there. Normally, they're both zero. And if they're zero, it, tell, it says, I am not going to start from a prior run. If it's non-zero, it says, I am going to start from a prior run. And if it's non-zero, then this one, I'm sorry, if it's non-zero, it tells you what season that was recorded in that prior run are you going to start from. This is, there, there's the, meth, the reason behind all this is the following. Suppose, as in one of the papers I happened to write with Tim Titus, you want to know exactly what happens on a certain day when the polar cap disappears. Well, you may want to start looking in great detail at a given period between, you know, between here and here. Some, uh, you think, okay, it's someplace between here. Or maybe it's over here. So you say, I'm going to start with this recorded season and look at it, individual time step time, what goes on. And you can do that with KRC. Or you can, if you want to, you find, oh, that's too late. You go back here and you can start with this one. So by the value of this thing, K old, its non-zeroness tells you you're going to open an old file. And its value tells you what record in that file you're going to get. Um, you can, and it, we've went, then it fills KRC.com, it fills everything with what, where you were last time you ran at that season. And you can now change those things that have to do with time, but not those things that have to do with depth. Because it's, it's assuming a certain layering scheme. But you can change things that have to do with time and surface values and boundary conditions and printouts and all kinds of other things and, and start looking in much more detail at what goes on. So that's where this, these two things came from. And the keep flag, if it's non-zero, it will start writing in the file you, just, you already opened. And if you're, if you're not careful, you can overwrite things that are already in that file. Another Fortran, quote, feature allows you to overwrite in the middle of existing files. 
Um, and so normally, you get, if this is 0, you have to give it, it's pretty interesting, you have to give it another file name for a place to put things. But it can, it can do all that. I'm not sure this still works. When I looked at this, you know, yesterday, I couldn't find all the code it took to do this. It may be there, but I couldn't find it. And so um, let's leave these zero for the moment. But here's the thing that, <laughs> see, I say powerful and delicate. This is, you know, there's a lot of you know, this delicate. stuff in here. Yeah. I mean, with the, with the current computer, this is less important. That's correct. Yep. Um, if an error occurs, here's what I would do. If here's what I recommend users do, if they uh, if an error occurs, first compare your input file to the master one. And if you, in Unix, you use a thing called diff. It'll list every line that disagrees. It'll list the whole line, but it'll list every line that has any difference in it. Spelling errors, spacing, anything. If the lines are identical, out they come. It's the first way to look for differences. So you, so you want to know, OK, what did I do that's different than the master? Check the help list to make sure everything that appears to be modified, make sure it you actually changed what you want. The other thing is not here, but Go back and look at your printout and see that those two names for variables, the one that, you, that it actually changed and the one that you think you changed, make sure those are all the same. And if you, can't, if you still can't get it to go, then this is what you need to send to the mentor. The input file, what appeared on the screen, and the print file, all three things, because different things go to the screen and go to the print file. Some of the... Some of the activity stuff goes to the screen and doesn't go to, I'm sorry, goes to the print file and doesn't appear on the screen. Things like the size of the cases and how many cases you can store um, go to that. So, and so someplace on the website, ultimately, you're going to turn this into acceptable language that, that gives the user some guidance. These are leans against the system. And this is a short list of things that I've thought up so far. Um, at the moment, I, I intentionally, because I was having trouble with compilers, uh, I intentionally commented out the lines that detect what type of computer you're running on so they can see whether or not you need to do byte swapping automatically. And that's a compiler problem which we ought to be able to solve some, between experts and me. We, we'll just get that solved. But at the moment, it doesn't detect this. Um, and the way you find out what you're running on is a Linux, in Linux is you, you name minus P or minus I. And this is what Bastion has, I686 and I386. And for my computer, I get this for both of them. Now, it turns out it's not a problem because the, all three of those have the same byte order, but other people, other users are going to have something different. So here's the problem we've got to solve. If, if we're going to use bin 5 files, we've got to solve it. Um, I don't know if there's Vaxes and Sparks were, were different. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, this is a professional programmer issue. How we deal with this, I don't care. It would, I, would, I would like to, I want to preserve the net result, which is when I send somebody a bin 5 file, his computer will read it properly. That's, that's the result. Okay, so that's, anyway, so that's one lean. I'm sorry, Kim. I was just going to say that running on Bastion is sometimes weird. Like if you get on Bastion and you get on a one yeah. or more instance, you can run on Okay. I don't know. This is just a lean, and I'm just willing to. There's another thing is the lack of a version number. When somebody, I'm thinking ahead, somebody has a problem, 
they said, I, you know, I'm using KRC and here's what I got, or I got this problem last week and I, I didn't think about it, and now I'm thinking about it, and here's the problem. And in between, ASU changed the nature of KRC. There's no version number in KRC. All you know is when it ran, you don't know when the, it was compiled. And so this is actually, I actually wrote, thought about this. These are all the code changes it takes to do this to make sure that the print files, the monitor, and the bin file files all contain the version. This is one way of doing it. Can easily be, we can do it some other way. And this is just all the little coding you need to do to do it. I would have done it myself, but then it would have violated our agreement that <laughs> ASU is now the repository of the master code. But this is an example. I mean, and it's it's an example now. I I, I hazard a guess that if I turned over KRC to somebody and said, put a version statement in that will appear in all three, it would have taken you a long time to figure out how to do it because it's just not simple. Here's some more. Um, how do we handle the master of code during this transition time between when I'm writing it and when Sadat is the, or somebody here is the guru, the curator? So we just need to handle that. We need to automate the processing of a new distribution. That's something that I was talking to you guys, Randy, a few minutes ago. That is, all the changes you need to make need to be captured so that they can be done automatically next time. We don't want to have to go through a discovery process with each distribution. The help list, it's .tex. It probably ought to be .txt. And in fact, that's the change I'm going to make. It's trivial in the link statement for me to do that. I think we want to make an HTML version with an index. The a real HTML that takes, you know, gets you around the stuff the way it should. I can easily make a PDF version with an index if we wanted to use that for a placeholder. That's, we just need to discuss that. These are things. Remove the alternate input options, which I, I haven't even talked about yet. But KRC allows you to go back and forth between taking input from the file and input from the keyboard. You do have to put in two, you put in the two things with the keyboard now, the name of the input file and the name of the print file. It asks you for those two. But there are ways to have KRC read stuff and then start taking it from the keyboard. And the question is, do we want to even leave that in there as an option? It makes no sense at all for a web-based version because you know, I'm not sure it makes any sense for me. KRC is, I'm not sure this is of use to anybody. I haven't used it for a very long time. It's just a complexity. We may simply want to get rid of it. Remove the debug options or not. This, these six parameters that set flags throughout the system. We need to resolve, there's a an extra word issue between Fortran and IDL, at least we need to understand it. And any reader is going to need to understand it. The fact that Fortran writes a hidden word at the beginning and end of files, and the size of that word depends upon the compiler options you'd invoked. And the poor guy that's getting the file has no way to know what the compiler options were. I, I'm pretty sure that is, there is absolutely no way without going and asking somebody at ASU to know what the size of that hidden word is. And it causes all kinds of problems. So I don't know how to get around that. that this requires somebody, this is to be Fortran and quote anything out here, just take away IDL. Make a reordered, a reordered entry form for input. This is what we talked about earlier today. Output, which is this is a translator between some version of input and the current input filer. And your real-time limit checks, some, the, the, some of these are already in there. Expert-only items last, and it may be a challenge to retain the flexibility, particularly of this fact that KRC can just keep reading change cards, go away, come back, read some more, go away, come back. So those are, are leans. Extras. In fact, we don't, there's more stuff here. 
it really is extra. We don't even need to get into it. So I am officially done. And what is the time, somebody? All right. Eight to five, Josh. Eight to five. He was on a plane late last night. I don't blame him. Um, we can, at this point, talk about whatever you wish related to KRC or not. Um, or nothing. Well, OK, so I suspect you guys are probably about brain dead, but I'm just guessing. Um, the food will be in my house at 630. I'll be in my house 45 minutes after I leave here. 